me it's a long time yeah, since you last dropped in to see me. <laughs> Too long entirely, but I'm certainly glad to be back. I'm glad to have you back, my boy. This seems like old time. Thank you, sir. By the way, I heard you had quite a trip this summer. Went back to England, didn't you? Yes, Mr. Bell, I must say I had a very delightful time renewing old friendships. Incidentally, I think you'll be particularly interested in one visit that I made. Hey everybody, what's up? It's good camera. We're listening to this, so we will see. that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered. I always referred to it as the adventure of the stuttering ghost. Stuttering ghost? That sounds provocative, Dr. Watson. I hope you'll find it so, Mr. Bell. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us the story of the stuttering ghost. But first, I'd like to ask a question. Men, wouldn't you like to feel that your hair always looks its best? That it always appears neat and... Isn't it? Then let me suggest... Oh, my God. As things change, things stay the same. Doesn't it always feel like that? And Kremel gives the hair such a nice, rich luster too. Yet it never, never leaves the hair feeling or looking so greasy or I cannot wait. My editor has my has the first of the script for my comic. So, once it's all done, once he looks over it, he'll probably call me back sometime. Yeah. I could see that the change had worked wonders for my old friend. There was a distinct touch of color in his usually pale face. Yeah, because he was on drugs. Watson, has it ever occurred to you that the entire course of history might have been changed, probably for the better, if paper and ink had never been invented? Oh, rubbish. It's good to be back in Baker Street again, eh, Holmes? Mm, yes. Back to the routine of stupid letters from stupid people after two peaceful weeks at the seaside. Peaceful? spent most of your time solving the problem of the lifeguard, the calabash, and the dying nursemaid. Merely a routine matter, Watson. Though it did have its points of interest. Anything startling in this morning's post? The usual trivialities. The Duke of Greenock suspects the Duchess of planning to elope with the underfootman. Oh, knowing the Duke, I can't say that I blame her. Quite. Doesn't anyone use imagination in committing crimes anymore? looks more promising. Huh? What is it, Holmes? Hmm. I shall present my problem to you at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. It's almost three now, and the letter's dated yesterday. Doesn't sound particularly promising to me. Who is it from? It's simply signed Ferdinand. Uh, God? Holmes, it might be royalty. Only reigning monarchs sign themselves to strangers simply by their first names. If you're referring to Ferdinand of Spain, he's dead, you know. Oh, you're pulling my leg. Still, I Every time I see that notification from, uh, from, what is his face? Who's his nice, you know, dazed eyes? His, his, his discord. How can you tell? 
Yes, Mrs. Hudson? You have a visit to Mr. Rose, and she's got a wee dog with her. She said you might be expecting her. Uh, very well, Mrs. Hudson. Show her up, please. Yes, sir. A woman and a wee dog. And here we are waiting for royalty. Uh, Watson, I've sometimes what? observed a distinctly snobbish strain in you. Most regrettable in these democratic days. Democratic, I voted well, conservative all my life. Please, oh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you dear, dear man. <laughs> oh, I've heard so much about you. Oh, I suppose you're wondering who I am. Naturally, mm. madam. Mm. Sit down, won't you? May I introduce my friend, Dr. Watson? Oh, How do you do, How madam? How do you do? I'm Mrs. Frampton. Mrs. James Frampton. That's the Buckinghamshire Framptons, you know. And I've traveled all the way up here with darling little Fursley. Oh, and he oh. does hate trains, don't you, sweetheart? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Watson is just like, uh-huh, uh, uh, I don't give a fuck. Uh, Among other things, the slight trace of an ink stain on your right little finger. Uh, oh, dear, it's so simple when you explain it, isn't it? Right. Well, since you're so clever, I did write that note. But only because Ferdinand here asked me to. <laughs> yes, the darling dictated it all by himself. He said, and I wrote it all down for him. What a dog writing note. Don't you think, Mrs. Frampton, that if your dog has any problems, a veterinary surgeon would be the logical person to consult? <laughs> oh, dear, now you've upset him. He's so terribly sensitive. Dr. Watson, hmm? I wonder if you'd mind taking him out for a little walk. Who, oh, me? Yes. Huh? I'd much rather he was out of the way when I tell Mr. Holmes about him. He's so human, you know. Really? I'm quite sure he understands every word I say. Oh, oh please, Dr. Watson. Oh, really, madam, I come, don't come, Watson. Uh, huh? Can't you see the little fellow's dying for some air? I think a little walk would do you both. Oh, it's all about, uh, oh, well, come along, you little blight, little fellow. Come on. Blight? Whoa. Whoa, you can't just call dogs that. What has brought you to see me? Well, Mr. Holmes, two weeks ago, one of Ferdy's gold collars was stolen. And a week after that, he was sent back to me with a very strange note. You have the note with you? Uh, yes. Yes, it's here on my purse. Put your hands up, Mr. Holmes. Well. That's right. Do you mind pointing that revolver another way, Mrs. Frampton? I have no intention of pointing it another way. Furthermore, you'd be astonished at my skill in using it. Not at all. Oh? When a woman has the audacity to call on me with the outline of a revolver plainly visible through the side of her purse, I naturally assume she is able to use it. You knew I was armed and yet you I didn't... regret to say that sometimes my curiosity overcomes my caution. And I was very curious as to the purpose of the ridiculous rules of the letter-writing dog. I still am. You'll very soon see. Go and sit in that upright chair by the desk there. Mr. Holmes, I assure you I won't hesitate to use this revolver. Go over to that chair. Very well. Sit down in it. With your back to me. That's it. I was admiring these handcuffs on your mantelpiece. They'll do very well to fasten you to the chair. Put your hands behind you. Thank you. What's the game, Mrs. Frampton? Daylight robbery? Yes. Or murder, if you don't help me. You realize that my friend is liable to come back at any moment? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. That beastly dog was a deliberate device to separate you and your friend. A colleague of mine will see that Dr. Watson is taken care of as soon as he gets outside. And now, Mr. Holmes, I do hope you're not going to be too difficult. <laughs> Wait, if, Mo if Watson is supposed to be telling the story... Then why? I don't get this. I'm still here.
assuming there was actually a movie. Oh, yes. Well, yes. thank you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Ah, there's the rescue party. Yes. Yeah, it can't be Dr. Watson right without you. We can take care of him. <laughs> Dr. Watson has resources that might surprise you. Yeah, but you Sometimes they surprise even me. Oh. Well, I've got what I can. Uh, unfortunate. You could have gotten the whole party. Holmes, I had the most amazing oh, experience. Yes, 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 you were set upon by a ruffian in the street. Phil asked for a match and then... Uh, you know. Elementary, my dear Watson. Huh? Now, that please get the key off the mantelpiece and unlock these handcuffs. Good heavens. I like your you trust you up like that. Mrs. Frampton, at revolver oh, point. You see? You hadn't made me go out with that little dog. She would never have revealed her purpose in coming here. Watson, the whole that thing was a plot to gain access to my files on the Rothier case. Rothier case? Why, that Hurry up with that key, will you, old chap? So, can we just jump this then? There you are. I say, how did that woman get out? Okay, Obviously, hold on. down the back stairs, as you didn't pass on the front. I assume her accomplice got away from... I Before that... Suppose we see if our caller took anything of any consequence. Why should anyone go to such fantastic lengths to steal the file on a criminal case that happened years ago? That's what we have to find out. You recall the Rotary well, affair, Watson? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. something to do with the jewel robbery, wasn't it? Yes. Robbery, so yes. yes. Rothier and his English accomplice, a gentleman known as stuttering Steve Hacker, stole the famous Shrewsbury Emerald. Yes, 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 the jewels were never recovered, but I was instrumental in bringing them into justice. I remember it now. Rothier was killed resisting arrest, wasn't he? Yes. And stuttering Steve Hacker was sentenced to seven years in Dartmoor. Right. George Watson, I have really? called a small item hard. in yesterday's That's paper right. that told of Hacker's death in prison. Yeah. That's the answer. You mean that on his deathbed, Hacker might have told yeah. someone the secret of where the jeweler is hidden? Precisely. The key to that secret must lie in these files. Let me see. Yes. Yes, I recall the case vividly really now. Now, there was a small piece of paper found on the body. Of the An apparently yeah. meaningless yeah. series of yeah. numbers and yeah. figures yeah. was uh, yeah. here in the yeah. file. Yeah. Now, she's yeah. got away with it, Watson. Yeah. I deserve to be kicked from here to night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, listen yeah. to me. I, I was going to the file a few weeks ago, making some notes of my story, and I remember coming across bits of paper. I copied the figures down my notebook. Bravo, Watson. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. Oh, thanks so much. Just a minute, just a minute. Here they are. Here are the figures. Where's the other hole? T2N302S50. Yeah, what the deuce does it mean, Holmes? I don't know, but I think I may have a glimmering. Thing. Get your coat and hat, old chap. The game's the point. Where are we going? To Scotland Yard. And then I hope we'll be on the track of the Shrewsbury Emeralds. Yeah, looks like it was a box. Yeah, it's a wall. Yeah, it's a You might at least tell me why we're driving about in this dreary part of London. I don't care for it at all, especially at dusk. Sorry, Watson, I was thinking. Inspector Lestrade has just informed me that he's unearthed a new clue in the case. Oh? It seems that when Ruffy was hiding from the police, he worked for a time in this neighborhood. Well, at a place known as Gaunt's Castle. It's somewhere here on the island road. Apparently it's a sort of museum run by a certain eccentric man named Jezra Gaunt. Well, His main claim to distinction is that it contains a catacomb, oh, oh. or to be precise, several catacombs. An ideal place to hide stolen jewels, I'd say. In catacombs? Here in London? Impossible. Not at all, Watson. But I thought they were vast underground tombs only found in Italy. Now, these are reputed to be reproductions of the early catacombs of Rome. Gracious me. Apparently, Mr. Gaunt found these deep underground caverns some years ago. And their natural yeah. contours made it but possible for you to convert them into a modern counterpart of the Italian ones. Ahead. All right, Kevin, this is the place. Okay, so, so, come along. Just to be clear, there this hole is the, the hole Thank you, Governor. that the leader fell come in. Come on, get up. The leader fell in this hole, and he has shattered a corpse while sitting on the back of it. So, this is Gaunt's castle. Oh, the reason I'm asking is, I'm 20 yards away. Like a prison. And it's getting dark. Why can't we come back in the morning, Holmes? I think there's someone watching us through the people in the door. Yes, there would be. Yes. 
Uh-huh. He's opening it. Good evening, gentlemen. It's a good date. I was just locking my museum up for the night. You're Mr. Joseph Gorn? Yes, sir. Joseph. My name is Sherlock Holmes. And this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, no, no. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Well, this is a great honor. Uh, please step inside, gentlemen. I'll, uh, I'll turn the gas up. Uh, I uh, hope you'll find the castle, as I call it, interesting. Mr. Gaunt, time is vitally important. Some three years ago, you had a man working for you as a laborer. His name was Rokey. I can't recall any man of that name, Mr. Holmes. He was a Frenchman, Mr. Gaunt. Does that mean anything? Oh, I'm sorry, but in this part of London, there are many yeah. foreigners, and many of them have worked for me. But uh, This man, Rothay, was a jewel thief. He is known to have hidden some very valuable emeralds, and it seems quite possible he may have hidden them here. Dear me, stolen jewels in my catacombs, Mr. Holmes? Oh, no, I... I want you to give us your permission to deduct a detailed examination of your case and to take some measurements. Yes, of course. What an extraordinary coincidence. Coincidence? Yes. A man and a woman were here a little while ago. I didn't pay much attention to them as they entered, but I happened to observe them later in the catacombs. They were taking measurements. Are you joking? Go on, Mr. Gordon. When they saw I was watching them, they were very evasive and left after a few moments. Until you mentioned taking measurements, the whole incident seemed unimportant. It was far from unimportant, Mr. Gaunt. They are desperate. We must work fast. May we start our search at once? Of course, of course. Yes. Uh, I'll go and light the gas. As you go, oh, you push him over the hole. Come to so attack me, must have come here straight from Baker Street. Yes, and we'll be back, <laughs> probably tonight. It's a race I'm, against I'm time. Oh, so they down. apparently haven't succeeded in deciphering the code. And neither have we. Watson, it's a battle of wits. <laughs> oh, really? They won the first round. Let's hope we can win the second. <laughs> Dr. Watson will continue his story in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to say, and just see if you don't agree with me, any man who wants that modern, prosperous appearance should certainly use a hairdresser. And men, I'm right here to tell you I wouldn't use anything else but Kremel hair tonic. Do you know why? Because Kremel is one hair tonic I've been able to find that really keeps my hair well groomed. Every hair neatly in place, yet it never has that greasy, plastered-down look. Kremel always feels and smells so clean on your hair. In addition, Kremel, Kremel does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. It relieves itching and dry scalp. It removes dandruff flakes. Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, easier to manage. Why not ask for an application of Kremel at your barber shop? Buy a bottle at any drug counter. Just see how attractive looking it keeps your hair. That's right. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Doesn't matter. My contest is here and now. Oh, that's a well, Dr. Watson, how did you and the great Sherlock Holmes make out when you explored the underground caves? For well, that first hour, so, we searched that strange place exhaustively without finding a clue. Then I remember we descended into one of the deepest and darkest caves. Must have been a weird picture as they stood there, our voices echoing hollowly. A vast black chasm yawning in front of us, and a piece of circle of gaslight throwing a pool of light. On the piece of paper which she seems very interested. Like, oh, God. Watson, I'm certain the figures on this paper are the clue to the missing emeralds. Emerald. Why can't I get the code? Then <laughs> <laughs> three, O, two, S, five, O. They might be pacing directions, well, obviously, but beginning where? I don't know, but two N could be two places north. Still, about T and O. T being the first letter is presumably the starting point. But what does it stand for? But of course. Here's the answer. Look here on the wall. You mean that color tablet? Yes. It's a common early Christian symbol known as known as St. Anthony's Cross. And it's also the Greek letter T. This is our starting point. T is the first letter in this code. And then comes 2N. Let's try it. Two faces north. So then comes the letter O. O. Oh, it could do. Uh, means zero. Yes, it could old chap. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, I had it. Remember that Rothier was a Frenchman. What's that got to do with it? The French word for West is West, spelled O-U-E-S-T. French compasses have an O where ours have the W. Two faces north, three 
Surely leave his records in carefully measured feet. If you have to take measure, why don't you try measuring it out in feet? Thanks. Now, push two feet. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to crush myself. Two feet. I'm not a crush myself. My quest <laughs> would be <laughs> here. <laughs> Give me the spade, Watson. <laughs> I'll do the digging this time. Thanks very much. So, the plates uh, shoot out of the wall. It's almost shaving off dead. But he, he falls back just in time. He has, he has judged it rather well. Holmes, if you dig any deeper, you'll come out in Australia. Yes, 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 trap. He's out of self. And yet I know we're basically on the right track. We knew you. What an unmitigated yes. idiot I am. But you only kind of. Look on the other side of this big metal. What's on it? It's yeah. marked in meters. Rote was French. Now we have the answer, Watson. Two meters north. Three <laughs> west. <laughs> Give me the spade again. Clear? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, whilst they I'm wrong this time, there, I'll retire from my profession. And non too dexterously What's uh, begin that? working the That's a metal box. You know, getting the, the trigger yes, out. Yes, I'm very much mistaken. We've found the Shrewsbury and it's great. Well, it simply blows and stab at anyone else that goes down to the rusty. It's, uh, it's a bit of a lengthy process, but eventually Exquisite. Oh, this gaslight, they look just like liquid jade. Quite a point, aren't you, Dr. Watson? Oh, hello, Mr. Gaunt, you quite startled me. Mm. We, must, so we found the treasure. I'm so glad that you've done the hard work for us. Look out, Watson, in the track. Come back here, Holmes. Well, you can have to see the entire Open the revolver gun. I missed our friend, Dr. Watson, but I won't miss you. Stand by your arm. In any case, Mr. Holmes can't get away. Unfortunately for us, he's run into a cave from which there's no exit. Gertrude, Alfie, here we are. Yes, my dear, clever of them, was I doubt whether we could have solved the code without their help. Scoundrels, I must not get my hands on you. I don't know what to do. Surely you are in no position to act. The three of us are armed, and your friend can't help you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, come out of that cave with your hands out. We've won the final round. Not when I have the emeralds, you haven't. All ready, man, are they up? It seems to me, Dr. Watson, that Mr. Holmes is being unusually stupid today. Be careful, Holmes! 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 Holm
penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Yeah, it even has a beneficial here. oil base, and which helps keep the hair from becoming dry. We're all using Cremel shampoo at our house. <laughs> I'd suggest you take a tip from my wife and buy the large family You do indeed the office showing Oh, Mr. Hacker, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, and Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Eye Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us the adventure of Black Angus. This is ABC, the American. No, I, 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 no not yet. We have to go down there, though. But it does look like we can get it from that way, so. I think that's a good idea to jump down. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once again, it's time to keep our weekly date with the Dean of Storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting it. I am indeed, Mr. Bell. Good evening. You're punctual to the minute. This is one doctor's appointment I'll never be late for. Oh, that's very nice of you to say so, my boy. Uh, drop your usual chair and settle down. Ah, that's it. Fire in the grape, the light turned low, the wind howling outside. 
the yes. perfect thing yes. for a Sherlock Holmes adventure. So Which one is it going to be? Here. Well, tonight I thought yeah. I'd tell you a most weird and macabre story. It concerns werewolves on the wild moors of Scotland. And the strange so happenings that took place this, in uh, McKinnon Castle. This, this gap here, here, here on werewolves the, uh, and haunted castles. Oh, my hair's beginning to stand floor. on end already. Like Please get on with the story, Doctor. In due time, Mr. Bell, but first have to uh, business, to try and and jump business that also has to do with right. uh, As uh, business. <laughs> oh yes. no, Doctor Watson, this isn't business; it's a pleasure. But thanks for the reminder. Oh my! And God. I know you men will thank me again and again for this. Try Kremel hair tonic. Just fuck notice how Kremel makes stubborn hair so much easier to comb. How your hair falls in place just where you want it and stays that way all day long. Now be pretty high. Did your Thank hair you ever look better? You see, Kremel gives even <laughs> dull, lifeless-looking <laughs> hair a rich, attractive luster. It makes hair look so handsome and alive. Yet Kremel really never glues way. hair down. It never Can leaves it looking or feeling greasy or dirty. Just try Kremel hair tonic once, and you readily see why it's such a nationwide favorite. I don't think it's well yeah. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the werewolf? Well, Mr. Bell... The adventure well, began well, innocently well, enough well, well, on a slate gray November afternoon in Baker that? Street, mm. just before the turn of the century. Holmes and I were seated comfortably, so comfortably on either side of a cracking fire, when shortly before Maybe. tea time, there was a jangle on our doorbell, and a few minutes later, a young girl, who Mrs. Hudson announced as Miss Victor, was standing before us. A young girl dressed in a wedding gown. She was in a great state of excitement. In fact, Almost. There's no one else to whom I can turn. There, 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 my dear. Compose yourself. If you will just tell us the facts, Miss Victor. Well, at three o'clock this afternoon, I was to have been married to David McKinnon. Any relation to the heir to McKinnon? The son and heir to the estate, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? I think I met one of the family in a shooting party a few years ago. I remember distinctly. Some other time, Watson, please. Miss Victor's problem is immediate. You say uh, you were to have been married, Victor. What and occurred to prevent the ceremony? David just, just didn't appear. And oh, it was dreadful. In the opposite side. I waited and waited. Uh, yeah. And finally oh, I knew he wasn't he coming. You had no word from him since? No, no, no. I went death. to his hotel as soon as I left the church. Roll what did you discover? Oh my God, that he'd received a visit from an elderly Scotsman this morning. And the porter said that they met day afterward, they left together in a car and said to a procession. Bankers. And Doctor, their destination was Scotland, no? Right. Mr. Holmes, you must find David for me. I know he's been kidnapped. Miss Victor, a man who is being kidnapped does not walk out of a hotel in broad daylight and order a cab. Well, something's happened to him. He wouldn't do a thing like this. Are you quite sure that you didn't have some lovers quarrel, something to tip in the last few days that might have made your fiancé? Of course I'm sure, Doctor Watson. We've never had any misunderstanding. Only something dreadful could have made him leave. I shall do everything in my power to find out what it was, Miss Victor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, Watson, get me the railway guide. Oh, uh, there you are. It's on the table beside you. I knew you'd help me. I only hope you'll be successful. Ah. Now, Watson, if you pack a couple of bags and meet me at the station at 9.15 in time for the Scottish Express, I have a few simple inquiries to make. What kept you so long, Holmes? We almost missed the train. You're shockingly out of condition, Watson. A little sprint like that shouldn't leave you so winded. Oh, never mind about my condition. Where have you been for the last four hours? Delving into the back issue files of the time. Very instructive. You should try it sometime. There's nothing duller than yesterday's news. I doubt it will call the legend of the McKinnon family dull, Watson. On the contrary, Oh, so that's what you've been looking up. Yes. It's a history that goes back several hundred years of brawling and bloodshed. The founder of the clan was a 14th century Scottish warrior by the name of Wolfhound McKinnon. He is reputed to have been so incredibly vicious in battle that his enemies accused him of being a werewolf. A vampire? Oh, come now. I'm merely repeating a 500 year old legend. The point is that the present head of the clan, the father of the disappearing fiancé today, is known as Black Angus. He's a dominant, thoroughly hated man yes. whose local reputation is as frightening in our day and age as his predecessors was five centuries ago. Oh, very interesting, Holmes, but I don't see why you get so excited over a 500-year-old legend. Well, you see, Watson, 
I found another rather okay, curious fact. Oh, what was that? Can Several times during the last few months, dogs have been found dead in the vicinity of McKinnon Castle with their throats torn up. Good heavens! village a good many years, I expect. Athletics, All my life, sir. Now. And this inn was my favourite before me. We're interested in some of the local <laughs> beauty spots, <laughs> particularly eh? McKinnon Castle. McKinnon Castle is no beauty spot, sir. Oh, really? Devil's Castle, we call it. There is no one of us in the village that wouldn't have been glad to see the ground open up and swallow the place. Yeah, I I I every McKinnon who lives there. Yeah. Why are the McKinnons so hated, Dennis? The thing is, like, there's no point in us going They're monsters. A McKinnon thinks that because he owns the land, he owns the air among breeds, too. And Black Angus is the biggest, blackest devil of the world. Black Angus? You mean the present laird? Aye. And if he keeps oh, up with his devil's work, he'll be the dead man before long. Yes, yes. What's been going on, Thomas? It's the sheep dog, sir. You hear about so one sheep dog is his living. And and six you more the have been killed in the past two weeks. 15, and all of the poor roll, wee beasties lying there on the moors uh, with their throats torn out. How can you blame McKinnon for that? Surely some animal is I, sir, I, an animal uh, yeah, stands or, or on you roll two feet. What are you suggesting, Thomas? I'm suggesting nothing, sir. The, 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 except uh, those uh, dead uh, dogs uh, all uh, had uh, human teeth so, uh, 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 on the throats. You're yeah, insinuating that Black Angus is a vampire? Oh, no, no, no. Really, oh, my dear. Okay, so oh, we've well, seen so it at night when the moon was high, galloping so across the moors on his big well, black horse. The same thing now. And the next morning, You've seen him yourself? Well, no, sir. But there are those that have. There's no mistaking him with his big coat flapping. And his how uh, we have will over his eyes. Oh, no, extraordinary business. Interesting. No, Very interesting. Do you see that gentleman that just came in, sitting by himself in the corner there, sir? The man in the grey overcoat? Aye. He's in his town again. He can tell you more about the McKinnons than I can. He's a cousin of the family. And even though he's related and lives at the castle, he's as nice a gentleman as you'd meet up with. Thank you for the information, Thomas. I think perhaps we'll go and have a chat with him. Come on, Watson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Excuse me. Mr. Humphreys? Hey. May we take the liberty of introducing ourselves? I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas tells me you are a cousin of the McKinnon family. I am. Uh, you know, fine, we're particularly interested in one of them, sir. Yes, in David McKinnon. Uh, David's a very fine boy. You knew he was to have been married in London yesterday? Aye, I knew that. Did you also know that for his wedding he suddenly disappeared? Let me work. Gentlemen, may I ask the uh, reason for your interest in young David? That's a very fair question, sir. I have been asked by Miss Victor, David's fiance, to try and find the young man. It's a very unfortunate business. Mr. Humphreys, shortly before the wedding yesterday, David McKinnon had a visit in his hotel. They left together, presumably to catch the express for Scotland. Oh, Miss Victor was left stranded at the church. She would be. Mr. Holmes, I wish I could help you in some way, but you can, Mr. Humphreys. How? By telling us what message you delivered to David at his hotel yesterday. I oh, come now, Mr. Humphreys. Right. Okay. The man so, seemed to be leaving the hotel with David was wearing a grey raglan coat, such as you are wearing. In addition, I observed as we sat down that you're reading yesterday's edition of the London Times. Even if you subscribed to it, it couldn't have reached you here in Scotland through the post this speed of it. Amazing. Elementary, isn't it, Mr. Humphreys? <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, your deduction is correct. 
Yes, Mr. Holmes, I did return with David from London yesterday. What was the message you were sent to give him, may I ask? The message that decided him not to go through with his marriage? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, Mr. Holmes. Although I may tell you, it's a family story to the greatest importance. Hmm. Well, in that case, our only recourse is to go to McKinnon Castle and pursue our inquiries there. That would be best, gentlemen, but uh, frankly, I doubt if you'll gain admittance. Angus is a willful man with a terrible temper, and when he knows you want to see David... We've handled terrible men before, haven't we, Watson? Yes, I remember that afternoon in Baker Street when Dr. Grimsby wrote picked up the poker and was yes, about to... Yes, Watson, you can regale Mr. Humphreys with that some other time. But now I think we'd better well, start into the crowd. Well, what was that? I saw that. What was that? If by any chance you do see Angus, oh, I must ask you not to mention that you've talked to me. <laughs> uh, if he finds out, <laughs> there room. might be Magic trouble. Magic room. All right, Mr. Humphreys. Come along, Watson. Come I wish they'd put some springs in this vehicle. It's worse than an Irish jaunting car. Let's secure the doors. If Thomas's directions will be believed, we should see the castle when we get to the crest of this hill. Black Angus seems to be quite a lovable character. Even Humphreys is disgusted. Terrified of him. Man was positively shaking. Yes, I know that. Ah, that must. Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Place, isn't it? Yes. Hope everybody's doing great. Oh my god. Oh no! Dead sheep dogs. I don't like dead animals. <sighs> Come on. Gentlemen, is the lad at home? I'm sorry, sir, but the lad will not see people we are to an appointment. Uh, then will you please give him a message? But the tool... Tell him that Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come here from London to see him. Yes, my good man, and, and tell him it's on a very important and confidential business. If you'll wait here in the hall, I'll give him the message, gentlemen. But he'll not see. He'll not see. Stupid old lad. You don't think he owned the castle. Watson, have a look at these two portraits. <laughs> a couple of grim-looking characters. Give them the creeps. I think we may reasonably assume they're McKinnon ancestors. Do you notice something odd about them? Well, the men are smiling. If you call that smiling, it looks more like leering to me. <laughs> Whatever it is, it shows their teeth. Notice the abnormal length of the eye teeth? I'm sure, yes. The teeth marks on the dead sheep dog. Quite. Black Angus seems to be living up to his name. It's well, very the door, but the lad will not see us. He asks that you please leave at once. A bit of an understatement. Yeah, you may tell him we're not leaving here until we've seen Mr. David McKinnon. I'm sorry, sir. Just a moment. I'm David McKinnon. You are splendid. We've come here on behalf of... I know where you're here, gentlemen. I must ask you to leave at once. But Miss Victor, your fiancé... After all, you know you... You heard my father's message. Please go. As for Miss Victor, I have no interest in hearing no, anything concerning her. Good day. Okay. Come, Watson. Right I think perhaps our visit was old time. We're going to piss and shit into really those please, uh, sarcophagus and those vampires. <laughs> yeah, because now it's not going to attract you. Let's get away from That's here. That's funny. I'm a principled young cadet, David. Yes, I'd like to give him a good so thrashing. It might be interesting to talk to David McKinnon when he's away from the influence of Black Angus. Oh, you're wasting your time, Holmes. A man's a bounder. Besides, they'll never let us in the house again. Front the front door, true. I hope he's still tied the bags. Leave your hat and coat in the bushes here, okay? 
head. Rumple up your hair, dirty your face, and adopt that delightful Scottish dialect of yours. For the moment, we will be plumbers. Plumbers? How do we know they need plumbers? In an old castle like this, you can always be sure of one fact. Something must inevitably be wrong with the drains. They always need plumbers. Home, do you think it's safe? I mean, if Black Angus discovers us, he may be dangerous. I'm afraid that's a chance we'll have to take. Come along, Watson, and try to look as much like a plumber as possible. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will continue the story of Black Angus. But first, here's something which should certainly interest you men about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml is one of the greatest improvements ever made in the history of hair tonic. It's been especially developed to keep dry, unruly hair in perfect order all day long. Always looking its best with a nice, rich luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that objectionable, greasy, patent leather look. That kind of hair went out of style with handlebar mustaches. No, Kreml goes in for modern, handsome hair grooming. And it does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It also promptly relieves itching of dry scalp and leaves the scalp feeling so clean and alive. May I suggest that tomorrow, when you're out for your Sunday walk or drive, you stop and buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Dr. Watson, oh, did you and Sherlock Holmes manage to get into McKinnon Castle disguised as plumbers? We did, Mr. Bell. Holmes is right about the drains. We were welcomed at the service entrance with open arms, figuratively speaking. Of course, we, we were shown down to the basement and left to our own devices. Just as scared, I found myself following Sherlock Holmes as he stealthily mounted an old stone stairway. I must confess that my heart was scraping and shuffling the stairway could lead us up to the east wing, I'd say. By the way, Watson, you make the most convincing plumber. Quiet, Watson. Not us this time. That must have been that. Don't slightly ajar. Come here, Watson. We can see through the crack. A man seated in front of a dressing table. I guess you chose the right room. Candlelight's flickering, but I'll give you odds of that's black angle. I don't like this, Holmes. I don't like it. He meant Holmes. He's got a revolver. He's raising it. Angus McKinnon, yes. put down that revolver. Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I told Bruce to throw you out. This time I'll do it. No. I'll send you. Mr. Mr. McKinnon, I know what you were thinking when you raised that revolver to your temple just now. And believe me, you're wrong. You can't possibly know. I think I do. You are convinced that you have been killing these sheepdogs. You have been so preoccupied with the legends of your great ancestor, Wolfhound McKinnon, that you think that your brain has snapped and that you've turned into a vampire. Okay, well, he'll but how you found out is beyond me. Get all that red on right now. The sheep don't get boats torn like to out. Yes, we here. know about them. In fact, we found out as we were driving out about a mile from here. I oh, now have that brought me the news up more than two hours ago. One more night. It won't happen again. You're convinced that you are responsible for these killings? What else can I think? All the evidence. The blood stains on my cloak. And I know those stains are not caused by human blood. You remember nothing? Nothing. second. But when I think of a heritage this of the McKinnons, how can I doubt them? Again, That's the reason your son was recalled from London yesterday. I tell you, you suddenly had proof of what you thought to be your own morbid tendencies. And so you sent a message to your only son, warning him that he must not allow the woman he loved to marry into a family stained with madness. Holmes, you seem to understand my problem. But I will not discuss it with you. Go away, both of you. McKinnon cannot go to his maker for strength. Mr. McKinnon, give me your help in a few hours, Grace, and I'm convinced I can prove to you that you're the victim of a devilish plot. A plot? I don't understand. Oh, come now, Mr. McKinnon. In this year of Grace, it's a little hard to believe in vampires. How can you disprove the evidence I've seen with my own eyes? The human teeth might have been hard to conceive of an instrument that could simulate those marks, Mr. McKinnon. But who could think of such a fiendish plan? And what would be the motive? I have a suspicion. But what's more important at the immediate moment is to find the evidence. Okay, so An instrument away. such as I've suggested would be damning proof. Well, Therefore, it would be hidden in the most obscure hiding place in the castle. Now, 
What would be the most secret place? The cellar? We have extensive cellars. We'll search them. But another possibility occurs. In castles as old as this, there's often a secret room, or as they were sometimes called, a priest's home. Quite Mr. Holmes. We have such a hiding place here, though I haven't been in it for years. A narrow stairway leads down between the walls from an entrance behind that big cabinet. Splendid, Mr. McKinnon. You have a lantern? There, on the dressing table. I'll like it, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. I have a strong suspicion that the solution of the postponed wedding ceremony, as well as that of the mangled dogs, lies at the foot of that secret stairway. <laughs> Now we shall proceed on our merry way to continue Such to a little place. The stool yeah. with cobwebs. Shall we peek out and around? Yes, we shall investigate. Nobody's been down here recently, Holmes, I'd swear to that. Give me the lantern, Watson, will you? Yeah. Uh, there you are, sir. Thanks. What were they doing? Uh -huh. Look oh, here in yes. the dust on the floor. Footprints. Footprints, Footprints leading to that old chest in the, in the corner of that. Yes. Doesn't seem to be locked. It seems if anything look, has... Gideon. See this devil's instrument? Yeah. What is it? That looks like a metal trap. It, it is, with jaws of steel and a powerful spring. Good heavens! And you can see the recent blood stains on it. This fiendish instrument gives us the answer to those poor dead dogs. You mean that this was used to tear up their throats? Undoubtedly. And look, more devil's work. Great Scott, a human jawbone with the teeth intact. This must have been used to leave the prints of human teeth after the animals were dead. I'm going to try and make me think that I was mad. The devil! Somebody shot him. Somebody shot the lantern out of my hand. You're too inquisitive, Sherlock Holmes. Humphrey. Yes, Angus, you're cousin. Well, don't you, Humphrey. I don't know what you and your meddling friends have found out, Angus. Your blood is to put yourself in my power. A priest dungeon will make a perfect coffin for the three of you. I'm going to lock the door at the head of the stairs. It's your only escape. I'm afraid death by oh. suffocation and starvation will be very pleasant, my friend. Oh, I'm afraid I'm coming oh, back up those stairs. And when I get my hands on you, the bandits and I fire. Your devil has risen! Oh. Watson, where are you? I'm here, by the children. How is he? Oh. I'm all now right, Holmes. I think the shot just crazed me. I'll strike a match. Has, a, has the altar been desecrated? Uh, yes. Mm. Flesh wound, as far as I can see. Good. McKinnon, is there another exit from oh, this room? There is, Mr. Holmes. Everybody help that me chest. Get the the storm slides out. Some secrets that the McKinnon family are only interested no. to those bearing the, the family name. Thank heaven for that. Now it's just to get out of here as soon as possible. Here in here is getting stale already. Thank heaven for that. Now it's just to get out of here as soon as possible. Here in here is getting stale already. Lean on me, Mr. McKinnon. That's it. That How are you feeling? A little shaky, but I'm all right, Mr. Holmes. We're in places, are we? We've been following this little passage up and down, and round and round. round. Right now we're behind the wall of the library. The entrance is ahead of us, concealed by a tapestry. Whatever that room was doing ritualistically will at least have been hindered. We're behind the tapestry. Someone's in the library. I mean, things are just... It's Humphrey's. My son, David. Shh. I was worried about those necromancy. Sherlock Holmes should learn the shame of the machine. David, mechanics. I'm afraid I've got shocking news for you. Your Let's father has confessed that he yeah. has been killing uh, the Let's turn to that place where he failed He knows that he's mad. He, he left the castle just now with a pistol. He plans to kill himself. Kill himself? <laughs> we must stop him. Oh, no, 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 my boy. Let him go. It's the best way. <laughs> Poor father. What can I do? There's only one honorable solution, David. Your branch of the family is corrupt, decayed. If your father dies and you disappear, the estate reverts to me, and we can save the McKinnon name with fresh blood. But Uncle, you can go to the colonists and start life over with a new name. It's the only way. We've heard enough. Come on. Can you like the last you lion? We overheard your conversation, Mr. Humphreys. Most enlightened. And we found this where you hit itself, filthy beast. A human jawbone. 
You'd knock the dogs with it. I'm trying to make me think that I've done it this time. Then what he told me in London was nothing but a pack of oh, lies. Of course. Mr. McKinnon, I suggest oh, yes. you send for the police. The police? What well, crime can they move me for? A few sheep dogs killed, and they can't prove I was responsible. There's, there's, a, there's a mob of people outside the window. Well, Mr. McKinnon, it's a, excuse me. It's a, it's a crowd of the village of Siri in an ugly mood. They say you're responsible for the sheep dogs being killed on the moors. They're threatening to burn the castle. I'm afraid they're getting out of hand. Go back and tell them that in a few minutes I'll come out and explain the killing. I survived. I'll go and talk to them, Father. Mr. Humphreys, possibly the law can do little to you, but the violence of mob rule may prove strikingly effective. I'll take this blackguard Humphreys out there. They'll know what to do with him. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to keep me away from them to tear me to pieces. Sign a written confession, oh. Mr. Humphreys, and we'll protect you. I'll sign anything. Just keep me away from that mob. You suggested that my boy should go to the colonies. Put it in writing that you'll do just that yourself. Give me a pen. There you are. Hello, Watson. I think we still have time to catch the night express for London. I hope you'll have no difficulty in obtaining three tickets on such short notice. Three tickets? Of course. I'm certain young David McKinnon will no, be accompanying us. I fancy we may be attending a wedding in a very few days. Did you do no. what? No. Did I and that's only I I attend the wedding? <laughs> you did, Mr. Bell. Matter of fact, her well, was no, 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 It was a very charming no, affair. No, 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 I'm sure it was. And now, Dr. Watson, you were, what about next week? Well, no, let me see. Next week, like, have you seen I'll tell you a story yeah. called yeah. The Adventure of the Hungry yeah. Cat, in which Sherlock Holmes you saves an innocent hard. man from the gallows <laughs> and brings to justice right, so a particularly vicious leaps over. and cold-blooded murderer. And then, smacking into the side of... Here's something which should interest you later. My wife has beautiful, natural highlights in her hair. And girls, I'll let you in on the secret of how she does it. I always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves my hair with a natural, glossy luster that lasts for days and days. Cremel shampoo actually brings out all the natural, glossy highlights that life can feel in the hair. In addition, it has a beneficial oil base that helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. This famous wall. hard water shampoo now, works now like magic in every be. type of water. And girls, you'll love the way its rich, luxurious right. foam penetrates yeah, right to the scalp that. and removes it's all really loose dandruff flakes like as fine. well as the dirt. Don't forget, yeah. Cremel shampoo is the same beautifying yeah. shampoo which it's those famous thing. million dollar powers models use. So why not glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Cremel shampoo? <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures and Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the hungry cat. Is it possible to sign it? This is ABC, yeah. the American Broadcasting Company. Is there any, like, English? 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 Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, yeah. starring Nigel Bruce, little Bruce little as Dr. Little Watson little and little Tom little Conway little as Sherlock little Holmes. Once again, it's time to drop in for a visit with our old friend, Dr. Watson, the storyteller beyond compare and confidant of the immortal Sherlock Holmes. And here he is, waiting to greet us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I must admit that on such a cold and foggy evening, your fireplace looks even more cheery than usual. And a very good evening to you, Mr. Bell. Here, come and sit down. 
Yeah, it feels good. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Nasty night out. Yes, it certainly is. In weather like this, I find my old wound gives me an occasional twinge. Giselle Bullock, you know. Souvenir of a border skirmish in Afghanistan. <laughs> Long before you were born, my boy. I've always been amazed, Dr. Watson, that with all the tight spots you and Sherlock Holmes found yourselves in, you were fortunate enough to escape with only one bullet wound. Yes, Holmes used to say that I was born to be hanged. <laughs> but I can remember more than one narrow escape. As a matter of fact, there's a souvenir of one of them right before you on the mantelpiece. On the mantelpiece? Oh. Small pot of ivy, a framed photograph of you and Mr. Holmes, two sporting prints, and, and a small blue saucer. Huh. Very exciting. You see, Mr. Bell, you have not observed, as my friend Sherlock Holmes used to say. That small blue saucer from which an ordinary house cat was accustomed to eat its evening meal was the key that saved an innocent man from the shadow of the gallows and brought a fiendishly clever murderer to justice. You will find it among my notes under the heading of the clue of the hungry cat. And Dr. Watson, I can hardly wait for the story. But first, here's something I'd like to pass along to you men. Every up-and-coming man today wants to look like a success. And neatly groomed hair adds so much to a man's appearance. So may I please suggest cremel hair tonic? See if you don't agree that there's all the difference in the world in Kreml. Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair in perfect order from morning till night. It gives hair a nice, attractive luster, too. Yet Kreml never plasters hair down with thick, dust-catching grease. It never leaves hair looking or feeling sticky or gummy. Kreml goes in for modern, more natural-looking hair grooming. The kind in such great demand today. Why not try it, man? K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the clue of the hungry cat? Well, Mr. Bell, it all began one day when Holmes and I, finding it a bit early for lunch as we walked down the strand, turned into the old bailey, wondering if the jury had yet brought in the verdict in the sensational murder case which Holmes had been following in the papers with considerable interest. As we entered First the courtroom, all, here, we heard the right? clerk of the court no. saying, Prisoner no Babar, you stand so convicted of murder by the verdict of a jury well, of your peers. Yeah, Have you anything to say before judgment is pronounced upon you? Only, my lord, the gentleman of the jury, that I am innocent of this crime. Silence in the court. You have been found guilty of the murder of Amanda Poe. The sentence of this court is that you be taken to that place from whence you came. And the two weeks of the day, on the 12th of October... Not the much, I'm just here at home. What's up with you? Yeah. Lord have mercy on your that is, uh... Uh, I talked to that guy. Uh, he's like, yeah, send in that application. I'll, I'll look at it. I was like, all right. He, he, it was through Facebook, and I'm like, okay. All right. Yeah, I told him I know you, and uh, he's like, Peter, I, I don't... Who? Yeah, I, I told him the guy that works on the car dents, and then he's like, oh, I know him. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm like, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, you know the Peter, and he's like, I don't, I don't know a Peter. And he's like, okay, uh, the the guy that works on cars. And he's like, oh that guy, oh. I'm like, oh okay, well I guess <laughs> he didn't know Peter. <laughs> he didn't know your name. Damn. Damn. Uh, well, uh, he's like, uh, yeah, uh, right now they're just messing me over on, uh, getting, they said it's gonna be two weeks out on everything, on getting, uh, people, it's gonna be two weeks out, that's what they, uh, that's what he heard from, uh, uh, actually hiring people through, uh, through the state and all that, what, what is it called, the, uh, you know, giving them drug tests and whatnot, they're like, it's a two weeks out, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's fine by me, and he's like, well, since you already have a job, you'll, you'll probably be fine for a little bit, and I'm like, yeah, 
but it should be fine. Come on, Watson. My curiosity is aroused. So yeah, no. Uh, where are you right now, anyway? Yeah, he asked me where I worked and stuff. He asked me like all the stuff I was doing. Like he's like, oh yeah, so you work at Publix, and then I explained to him like what I did and all that. And he's like, yeah, no, it sounds good. I assure you, my dear, that I'm not. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Okay. Did did you want to do something for dinner or something? I cannot bring myself to believe that he stupidly and okay. killed Mrs. Post to conceal a minor theft. Oh, I can't tell you what it means to me. Just to hear you. I mean, sounds good to me. I'm down for it. Yeah, no, uh, you, uh, you know Dan and uh, Corey are at work right now, so... Yeah. It's okay. I'm off uh, Friday, so we could probably do something Friday or something like that. Maybe set up for a game or something like that. Yeah, we could. Uh, what would you want to play anyway? As the next door neighbor okay. where the tragedy occurred, Mrs. Yeah. Won't you tell us in your own words just what happened? Yeah, I need to I need to look over the rules and stuff like that. Right now I'm streaming my art. Yeah. No, you're good. I'm I'm just in the middle of I'm just in the middle of uh, making the fixing this and finalizing it so that I have an emote. I've got to finish all my emotes and stuff like that. Put it on my Discord and stuff like that. So that people have it. Not that I'm the type of and then, huh? Yep. I gotta do. Uh, I gotta do Pat's thing, and then I gotta do. Uh, I got so much stuff. Well, I mean, those aren't commissions, but uh, I got one from uh, D20 Thoughts. Did you see Mrs. Post way back to him? He's, he wants me to draw his emote for him. And I'm like, okay. All right, fair enough. Yeah, D20 Thoughts, that guy that uh, Corey found. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah, I, re I kind of remember this guy, whoever he is. Yeah, fuck, uh, fuck him. He's got enough money for it. Fuck him. And I didn't notice nothing next yeah, he's a choice streamer. He can go fuck himself. So. Oh, my goodness. No, I, uh, right now everything's been going good. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'll see you when you get here, man. Alright, peace. Hmm. Most enlightening. Oh, no, really, home. Was that the cat's usual habit, Mrs. Roberts? No. Amanda Post was loony about that cat. Can you go back, Archie? Gave it its supper every night at six regular. Liver she used to feed at the six a pound. Now that's scandalous, that if you ask me, with that. poor did people's cars. Yes, I see. Then what did you do? Well, you should continue to clear I fed the cat, the and, and then I went then to bed. Think you should do the combat. And the old man and I were sound asleep as two blessed angels in paradise. When we heard the fire engine. And now everyone realizes that if everybody came across, we will find some vegetables and some growth on the other side. Now you're right now. Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. I greatly appreciate the assistance you've given us.
Good day. Oh, not at all, Mr. Holmes. It's been a pleasure to ride you. But, Mr. Holmes, all that woman's evidence came out in court. There's nothing there to help you set Robert free. Well, I'm afraid you're right. I'm dashed if I can make head or tail out of that stream of nonsense that woman spotted at us. Don't be too hasty, Watson. I should like to call your attention to the curious incident of Minnie's supper. That night, the cat didn't get her supper. That was the curious incident. <laughs> Oh, Holmes, will you put down that violin for a moment and pay attention? This is the third time since we got home that you've interrupted what I'm sure might prove a magnificent composition, my dear Watson. What's the matter now? Well, listen to this note. My dear Mr. Holmes, may I request your immediate presence at my home on a matter of the greatest possible importance? I enclose my check for 500 guineas as a retainer, signed Jeffrey Brookfield, in brackets, the Earl of Brookfield. 500 guinea retainer. You, you come and sit here on Baker Street, playing the violin. If you like, you may write to Lord Brookfield and tell him that the paintings over which he's so worried have been sold by his son to provide jewels for the dancer with whom the young man is enamored. And uh, sent his check back to my company. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? A uh, gentleman to see Mr. Holmes, sir. Uh, Mr. Post. Mr. Post? Oh, yes. Show him up, will you please? Yes, sir. You act as though you expected this fellow Post. When I put a ferret down a hole, Watson, I usually do so in the expectation of starting a rabbit. You mean those questions of yours, Mrs. Roberts, this afternoon? Yes. Our garrulous friend, Mrs. Roberts, is not the type to keep a visit from Sherlock Holmes, a secret from the neighborhood. Mr. Post, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Mr. Post. Carl Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Quite. And this yes, is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Good evening, sir. Uh, doctor. Uh, won't you sit down? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I prefer to stand. I, uh, I must confess I'm somewhat upset by what my former neighbor, Mrs. Roberts, told me this evening. Oh? What was that? Uh, that you and Dr. Watson and that young woman were asking questions this afternoon. There's nothing for you to be upset about, Mr. Post. Right. But I confess that the unfortunate matter of your late you wife's death right? had certain features well, which seem to me odd, shall we say? But this morning, well, Sanders well, was found guilty and condemned to be hanged. I'm aware well. of that. But as long as you're you here, Mr. Post, I'm sure you won't mind answering the question or two. Not at all. Do I feel so? Oh, do, do sit down, Mr. Post. You're making me nervous. Walking well, back I'm and forth, back and forth. I'm, I'm awful sorry no, about that. Ever since this horrible thing happened, I can't seem to sit down. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Sanders. I was born in three years, wasn't it, Mr. Post? He was, he was. I sacked him. The fellow was always nosing about things that didn't concern. And according to him, you still owe him eight pounds back wages. Not a bit of reason. I was so lost. After all, a matter of eight pounds could mean very little to you. You'll pardon my mentioning it, Mr. Post, but you must be a man of considerable wealth. Now, if you mean since my wife's death, yes, I am. When I came to England from Australia a couple of years ago, all I had was a few hundred pounds of some business experience. I met and married my dear Amanda within the past year, Mr. Holmes. And a finer okay, wife no man ever had. I can assure you. Uh, no, I'd give all the wealth she left me and a dozen times over to have her back with me. Mm -hmm. so of course, the sentiment does you credit, sir. Quite. And now that I've met you, Mr. Post, let me assure you that any doubts I may have had in the matter are entirely resolved. Ah, I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Holmes. You'll pardon my intrusion, but. Well, you understand. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, good night, gentlemen. Oh, good, good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Post. Oh, I see that one because of Well, Holmes, yeah, I'm glad that your doubts, your doubts have finally been set at rest. Yes. Any well, lingering well, doubts I may have had of the innocence have now been completely removed. Hmm? That's good. Sanders' innocence? Watson, does it occur to you that there's something about our friend Mr. Post that doesn't quite ring true? Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Seems to me a fine, upstanding fellow. But did you happen to notice his curious way of pacing up and down? Oh, man's overwrought. We can't keep still. It's natural enough being a doctor. Our sitting room, Watson, is 23 feet in length, with no obstructions in the area where Mr. Post chose to do his pacing. Yet he turned automatically again and again at each end of what I estimate to be an eight-foot walk. Eight-foot? What are you driving at? Eight feet, Watson, happens to be exactly the length of a prison cell.
just a moment, we'll rejoin right, Sherlock Dr. Holmes and Dr. Watson as they All try right, guys, to solve yeah, the mystery of the strange yeah, death of right, Amanda Pope. Right, now, let's see what the ghoul does. Did you know that a recent survey showed Kremel hair tonic was the hair tonic Alice, preferred no. among America's top flight cool, executives and better dressed men? Well, this isn't at all surprising because like, Kremel is famous for giving hair that smooth, well-groomed appearance, for which there is no substitute. Maybe and what's so important, like Kremel does lots more than like just keep hair looking handsome. Like Kremel removes like dandruff flakes. It promptly like relieves like itching of scalp due to dryness and actually helps condition the hair, hey. in that it leaves it feeling so much softer. Uh, it's more like Notice it's how much easier your hair is there, to comb. Like how every like lock falls right in place and stays that way you. all day long. Well, and remember, whereas Kremel gives hair a rich, attractive luster, it never leaves hair well, looking that. or feeling weak. Ask for an application well, of Kremel at your barber shop. So. Buy a bottle at any drugstore. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. I have a sling. I can definitely throw it this far. And now, Dr. Watson, what did Sherlock Holmes do after he caused your attention to the odd behavior? It was too late that night for doing anything. Although Holmes did send over cable to Australia, Asking for all available the information knows, on the mysterious Mr. Post. How would we know? But, know. right and early the next morning, Holmes and I set off in a hansom cab. Uh, on the floor, I finished my breakfast. Our destination being the fire brigade station, nearest the late Mr. Post. You are convinced the fire was incendiary, Captain? No, oh, no question in my mind at all, Mr. Holmes. Blazing like a guy for peace it was by the time we got there. Oh, I if I never wet it too. down, there was a smell of paraffin oil strong enough to choke me. So you have very right to send for the police? Oh, okay, I did that. Just as soon as I found that poor woman dogs. lying dead in her bed. Oh, yeah. that's a bit... No, I thought she died of publication. Well, the medical evidence that she'd been strangled okay, so before the fire started was clear enough. I know Dr. Richardson, the sound so man. Very sound. Man. And it was you who found the cash box, Captain? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Being of stout metal, it hadn't come to no harm. Very hot fire like that sometimes is a freakish way of burning some things to a crisp and leaving others almost undamaged. You think we are going to see an argument? I well, wish I could have inspected there, the house the morning after the fire. Watson, this shows you the disadvantage of attempting to follow a cold trail. Well, I'm sure I don't know what you expect to find. I don't know well, myself, but there must be something that you won't be any good, Mr. Holmes, because it's a regular ragbag collection of odds and ends. But most of the things from Mrs. Post's bedroom are right back there on that table in the corner. Those that weren't too badly burned, but they would have been thrown out this morning. The police made a sweep them into the office of the fire. Capital. Capital. Yeah, we'll find yeah, out we'll take a look at them. Uh, All right. Let's get out of the combat, then. We'll just go. Just go into the back corner. Smells well, more like a yep. salvage sale. Curious looking collection. And what is that horrible-looking object? Uh, some kind yeah, of a stuffed fish that was mounted on a plaque. Oh, it says, souvenir of Brighton. Mm -hmm. And over there is a poor woman's yeah, hair pillow. Be it's be hot stuff to the bottom. What's there? Oh, a uh, Bible with the covers. Also, see through the And an alarm clock would have been on the bureau. You see that when you picked it up in the attack. the moon, I see. And this strange looking thing turned out to be the late Mrs. Post Corset. Uh, well, well, you you left left it. Oh, the gruesome, I must say. Makes me think of the relics we'll all have to leave behind when we shuffle off this mortal coil. Don't be morbid, Watson. And the handsome silver was on the dresser. And these people in the picture and bathing with soap. I'm afraid that's the whole collection. Well, I guess that's what we learned really from right. that. Hey, Holmes? Yeah, As I told right. you on previous occasions, Watson, you will see, but you do not observe. And what, may I ask, is to be observed from this insanity and odorous collection? Only enough, I trust, to remove be Robert Sanders from the shadow of the gallows and to substitute the estimable Mr. Post in his place. Good gracious me. Let's toss. Would you be good enough, Watson, to ring for Mrs. Hudson? All right, Holmes, if you say so, but how do you expect the frightened post into confessing that he murdered yes, his I'm wife good. and then set the I house on fire while he was 50 miles away in Brighton is beyond me? Yes, you are in possession of the same facts that I am, Watson, and since you know my methods, you should be able to reach the same conclusion. I must admit. Come in. Oh, you rang, Mr. Holmes? We're expecting a visitor, Mrs. Hudson. Mr. Post, who was here last night. Oh, I remember him, sir. A very nice gentleman. He tipped me a shilling on his way out. I have reason to think that he'll be here very shortly. Will you show him up as soon as he arrives? All right, sir. You were saying? 
I was about to say that the problem no longer lies in the solution of the crime. That, of course, is obvious to anyone. Well, uh, uh, well, they can. Certainly, uh, almost. The difficulty is I sure. haven't a shred of evidence. Therefore, the only possibility of justice being done is through forcing a confession from Mr. Post by suddenly facing him with an utterly unexpected reconstruction of what actually happened. I just want to let you arm yourself with your service revolver. I have reason to think that Mr. Post may react violently. She said this room is the same as the way out of the house, yes? Loaded and ready. But I do think, Holmes, that if you're so sure that Post is a murderer, you might at least tell the police. I very much That's doubt that Scotland Yard would, 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 would admit itself completely in the wrong without proof, which of course I think not. No, Watson, I'm... Well, Come in. No, 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 no. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Around the well. Good evening. The well I received your note, Mr. Holmes, asking me to call on you at once on a matter of the greatest importance. I am sorry to trouble you at this hour of night, I suppose, but I have one or two puzzling questions which I don't like yet, which have been bothering Dr. Watson and myself. But I thought you said last night that all your doubts have been resolved. They had, Mr. Post. But I didn't specify what doubt. I'm afraid you're being a bit cryptic. And I beg you, Mr. Holmes, to come to the point. Very well, Mr. Post. Let me present you a reconstruction of what I can only term a highly ingenious crime. Crossbow, pistol, a foil, and warp A certain man, who for the moment shall be nameless, meets and courts a wealthy woman, who, despite the handicap of her deafness, is still attractive. And man, very interesting, Mr. Holmes. Then, ruthlessly and in cold blood, he strangles this poor, foolish, credulous woman, knowing that under her will he will inherit her fortune. I know what you're insinuating, and I... Then you admit... I admit nothing. No reason why I have to stay here listening to you insult my wife's memory. Sit down, Mr. Post. You don't dare leave till you discover just how much I really do know. Very well, Mr. Holmes. And just how does this man do what you say he did without getting caught? After he's strangled her and his other preparations have been made, he stands in the front door of their house, ostensibly waving goodbye to the wife who already lies dead upon her bed. Holmes, Mrs. Roberts said that the, the fond farewell is answered, Watson, by a curtain that moves in one of the front windows. Who is there to know that the curtain has merely moved at the twitch of a string held in the murderer's hand? At, at least, Mr. Holmes, I must congratulate you on your ingenuity. But there were a couple of things the husband overlooked. First, many his wife's pet cat. Minnie comes to the back door being I mean, the Her plaintive search and scratching produce no result. And why? Because the wife who usually feeds Minnie already lies dead. That's what you meant, home. Precisely. Right. After which the house is silent until midnight, when suddenly a fire breaks forth. A fire of such intensity as to consume almost all the evidence of the crime. No, and, just, most important of all, a fire which was meant to right, produce in the eye of the beholder an unshakable alibi for the husband, who at that moment was so far away. The fact that Sanders chose to break in that same uh, night was sheer good luck for the murderer, yeah, yeah, for he gave the police a ready-made suspect. Yeah. And now let me ask you one question. Yeah. Sir. Just how did the husband of whom you speak produce this conflagration while he was at least 50 miles away? Probably by means of some simple attachment connected to the alarm clock in his wife's room, which was set to go off at 12 midnight, Watson, not 12 noon, as you surmise. An attachment which was later destroyed by the heat of the fire. He's already got a pretty piece of fiction, Mr. Holmes. Of course, it would never stand up in the court of law. I'm not so sure, Mr. Post. Oh, I am. After all, it would just be your word against mine. Yes. The word of Sherlock Holmes against that of an ex-convict. Why, you two of yeah. whose previous wives and died in Australia under suspicious circumstances. I won't listen to any more. What's been said is sufficient. He'll never get me for those other two. Not for this then you'll do it, Nick. Yes, yes. Yeah. I killed my wife. But you'll never see Look me as part of it. Puckles. I said, Watson. Is that a word? I don't think so. Flesh wound in his shoulder. Something like for a few minutes. Wait, we didn't specify. You live, I'm afraid. Watson. If you hadn't thought that, oh, 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 Seems like a perfectly ordinary cop to me. Yeah, as I, I remarked before, like Watson, you see, but you do not observe. Yeah, Why would a woman who is stone really deaf have set an alarm clock to wait on her at 12 o'clock? Yeah, well, of all the blind idiots. Quite. And now, chap, ring for Mrs. Hudson, will you? I think perhaps the police might be interested in our friend, Mr. Post. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm at my own comfort zone now, so you guys...
Yeah. Yes, Mr. Post can yes, so grab the hand up in the energy shield. Mr. Bell, well. when he was we'll confronted we'll with the evidence in court, plus the cablegram that Holmes had received from Australia, telling about Post's rather murky past, he went all to pieces, broke yeah. down and confessed yeah. everything. Of course, yes, Robert Sanders was immediately set free. Research. I see. And now, Dr. Uh, Watson, before you tell us about next wrong, week's story, may I ask our lady listeners this question? Oh, of course, my dear fellow, of course. Did you know that the makers yeah, of Cremel Hair Tonic that also that make a remarkably beautifying shampoo? That's it. Yes, and quite naturally, it's called Cremel Shampoo. The famous Powers models were among the first to discover its amazingly beautifying... There we go, I got it too. And here's their consensus of opinion. There's nothing oh, honestly, better right than Cremel Shampoo to keep hair shining bright hair today. Each tiny strand just gleaming with natural glossy luster. Cremel shampoo works like magic, even in the hardest work. Its rich, active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Oh, and don't forget about its beneficial oil base. This helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle and leaves the hair so much softer and silkier. We always use cremel shampoo at our house, and my wife is here. She buys a large family size. I'll go as for as long as possible until I need to. What about next week? Well, let me see. Next week. This week, I think I'll tell you about the incredible and rather grim happenings that transpired in the ancestral home of the Burley on the storm swept Cornish coast. I will have to charge my tablet in just a while, but we should be fine for a little bit. And then I will, I will stop stream for a little bit, and then I will turn the stream back on when I get it fully charged. Should have done that beforehand, but wasn't thinking, so goat made a mistake. Sorry. This is Joseph Ooh, Bell, speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo. Right, I'm inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. And Dr. Watson will tell us about perfect. Sherlock Holmes' encounter with Professor Moriarty. This is ABC, the American Broadcast. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, let's drop in on the famous colleague of Sherlock Holmes, our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. And a very good evening to you, Mr. Bell. I've almost given up hope of your coming tonight. Well, I know it's pretty late, Dr. Watson, but I saw that your light was still on, so I thought I'd drop in. I'm glad that you did, Mr. Bell. Applying the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I would venture a guess that you're on your way home from the theater. Amazing deduction, Dr. Watson. Not by elementary, Mr. Bell. Isn't that a theater program? I see sticking out of your pocket. Oh, of course. Oh, what was the play? <laughs> Hamlet. Very fine production, too. Have you seen it? No, oh, not lately. But I think I can claim to be one of the very few men in this world to have seen a far older Hamlet than any that you saw before tonight. Oh, An older Hamlet? I don't quite understand. Some 400 years older. You've heard me speak of Professor Moriarty. The arch-villain whom Sherlock Holmes considered his most worthy opponent? Precisely. I think that Professor Moriarty would cheerfully have given his right arm to possess the Hamlet to which I'm referring. At least he was quite willing to commit murder for it. I remember... Oh, but here I am monopolizing the conversation when I knew or know that you've got something quite important to, uh, to tell our listeners. Yes, Dr. Watson, I'd like to tell our listeners about a modern trend in hair grooming that's in such great demand today by men who value their appearance. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. Frankly, man, Cremel is the only hairdressing I've ever found that really makes my hair stay in place. An outstanding feature of Cremel is that it always keeps hair so neatly groomed, yet never gives it that cheap, greasy look. Cremel never leaves hair full of sticky goo. 
Your hair feels so soft and looks so natural. And men, don't tell me that you won't be mightily pleased when your wife or sweetheart remarks how attractive your hair always looks. How it feels so nice to touch. Never greasy or sticky. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about yeah. Professor Moriarty and the original Hamlet? I'm all ears. Okay. It all began in the most commonplace manner imaginable. I was walking down the street with Holmes in answer to a completely routine call from Scotland Yard. Hurry up, Watson. Don't lag. I must say, Holmes, that as a medical man, I hugged endorse this recent passion of yours for long... Risk walks. Yep. My oh, dear Watson, uh, grab, the constant grab, succession of dull cases with which we've recently I'll been favoured leaves me with so much surplus energy that I can only I'll sleep by ahead. exercising I'll myself into a state of utter and stuperous exhaustion. Good heavens, that I see there's a pub right across the way. I hope you'll at least let me have the pleasure of standing for a drink. It's the quickest fee I ever received. I'll lead the way, sir. Two whiskeys and sodas, miss. Allow me to introduce myself, sir. My name's Franklin Burley. Oh, and here's, uh, here's my card, Mr. Burley. Not the Dr. Watson. Oh, if you mean the little paper I wrote on the, the common cold in the last issue of the last... I don't know about that, but aren't you Sherlock Holmes' colleague? You know you're yes, suffering. I just as God as sent you to me, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? I've been wanting to put my problem into competent hands. What do you mean? I didn't stumble in front of that carriage, Dr. Watson. I was pushed. Someone's been trying to murder me. No, 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 Mr. Burley. I'll tell you it's the truth. Two weeks ago, a wheel came off the carriage that I was driving, a most convenient accident. Last Wednesday, as I was passing St. George's in Hanover Square, an enormous board of timber fell, missing me by less than a yard. Why on earth should anybody want to kill you? Here you are, gents. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because I saw it, Dr. Watson. Saw what? I saw the ghost of the Burleys. They are. Which no man may see and live. No, no, my dear fellow. After all, now, this is the 19th uh, century. We're a very old family, the Burleys. Not nobility, but right, just as old, uh, just as proud, and around just the as poor. My father left me two inheritances. The magnificent Burley Library, which has been in our family for over 300 years, and the Burley Ghost. Oh, you needn't look at me like that. I'd always scoff, too, when I heard tales of the ghost. But a week ago, I saw it. Yeah, all the other idiots. Uh, very well, Mr. Berry, may I ask whose ghost it's supposed to be? Supposed the original collection see. of books in the library was stolen from an abbey expropriated by Henry VIII. Oh, when the abbot resisted, he was killed. <laughs> and it's his ghost that, according to legend, haunts the library. I don't suppose you could describe the ghost. That's where you're wrong, Dr. Watson. <laughs> I saw it, or him, if you prefer, quite clearly. He was extremely tall, very thin. His forehead, a high, pale curve, with his eyes, so two go, sunken Charles, pits of right black. <laughs> but most of all, I was and struck by the slow, so almost hypnotic, right? constant oscillation of his head when from side to side, uh, in a manner which I could only describe as curiously and horribly reptilian. Yeah. You and Mr. Holmes must uh, help me, Dr. Watson. Yeah. You must. Uh, yeah, I can see from your expression that you think I'm merely suffering from delusions, imagining persecutions that do not exist, but I tell you, my life is at stake. Mr. Berlin, as a medical man, I'll admit that All right. at least Should you I believe you're telling the truth. Increase the number of ads Come in. Uh, do you live alone? Them? No, my son lives with me. Uh, good enough sort, though I could wish he had a bit more purpose in life. But his wife. Uh, what about his wife? When my son was in Salon running a tea plantation, he married a half-caste woman. She's utterly strange, a terrible creature. 
is that the, 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 the weird alliance, isn't it, between your ghost and your son's wife? All right, Mr. Burley, I'll speak to Holmes, if that's the only thing that'll set your mind at rest. It won't be the first time that he's driven a ghost back to its lair. receiving my closest attention. Yes. So your friend, Mr. Burley, suspects oh, his right, son's heart can't quite. Go on. Yeah, all is good. So. I promised him that I'd I tell you a story, although obviously the poor man is the victim of a persecution of I wonder what. I wonder what. Oh, now, now, really, Holmes. There are certain definite points of interest. That description of the ghost, for instance. Tall, very thin, high forehead, with a constant consolation of his head in a reptilian manner. Who does that remind you of, Watson? I know. Yes. I don't know. Could it be anyone but our friend Moriarty? Good heavens, you're right. And the library of the nature that you describe might well yeah, contain treasures worthy of the professor's highly selective interests. I tell you, Watson, it sounds precisely like Moriarty. The inspection of the library in his ghostly guise, followed by the realization that if he's to secure without suspicion the treasures he covets, their yes. owner's death is necessary. Finally. Come, come, Watson. Stop lounging in your chair. Oh, but where are we off to? Mr. Burley said he was returning to an ancestral home home at the seaside in Cornwall. Yes? We shall join him there. It has been too long since I crossed swords with such a masterly adversary as Professor Moriarty. <laughs> except from the sea. The bar yeah. seems to divide just up there ahead of us. Of course, that fool of an innkeeper didn't tell us which fork to take. A problem, Watson, but not one incapable of solution. May I ask how you propose to solve it? Deductive reasoning, I suppose? That's not at all. High. I shall merely inquire the proper direction for that boy who seems to be birds nesting behind those bushes. Oh. Here, young fellow. Hi, my lad. Of course right not. Now. There's nothing to be frightened of. We simply want to know the way to Burley Manor. Eh? Uh, Burley Manor, my boy. To the right or to the left? Oh, you want Burley Manor, eh? That is the impression we are trying to convey. <laughs> Everybody knows where Burley Manor is. Oh, we know. What is it? Straight along the path. That way. <laughs> I'm trying. It's really sight. slow. When will our civilization advance sufficiently to reduce a race free of such pitiable creatures as that? Oh, I don't know. The boy looks well fed and happy. Why? Shouldn't he? Nothing to do but walk round barefoot and climb about the cliffs all day. Seems on a pleasant life. <laughs> I wouldn't like to slip behind the sarcophagus here. If you're looking for that barefooted boy, madam, he went off towards the cliffs. Oh, he only wants me back for hours. He owns birds' nests and eggs. Send them for a few pennies. Then it's on hobby. Oh, there's bats. Two little birds testing myself when I was a boy. Oh, I wanted him to run an errand for me. I didn't know that. The boy told us that we should take this path to Burley Manor. But he seemed to trifle the one here. If you're going to Burley Manor, I will be glad to show you the way. I'm Mrs. Hey, Stephen Bird. Good Lord, not the... Uh, <laughs> your father and I invited him down to see his library, Mrs. Burley. May I introduce Dr. Watson? Uh, how do you do? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm very glad to know you. I'll, I'll look behind him. Now, if you'll I'll just follow just, me along the path, it's rather narrow, so I'm afraid we'll have to go in single time. <laughs> 
of weird old books in there. Sure. Stuff's never been catalogued. Can't make any sense out of it myself. No, it's not my dish of tea either. <laughs> okay, so you see Felt like reading Hamlet one night. Right? Found some old yeah, black leather thing I could barely stuff. spell my way through. Okay, I from the little I made out, it wasn't even the right form okay. of the play. Really, Mr. Oh, Burley? How was yeah. that? Oh, it started out with some sort of a prologue. Stuff. All about ghosts and revenge. Never saw that in Hamlet. Stephen, where is your father? I haven't seen him since I passed his lunch. Has he gone off to the cliffs already? You must have just missed him, Mr. Holmes. He often spends the day browsing about out there. Takes lunch along with him. Yeah, and he's gone off alone? <laughs> Which path did he take? Okay, so the one toward the cliffs. But I don't know. Watson, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> catch up to him in time. What was all that about, so, uh, about Hamlet, well, Holmes? Only that there is indeed a treasure here, Watson. Well, well, One fully well, worthy of Professor Moriarty's distinguished attention. <laughs> treasure? Like what sort? From Stephen's unseen it. description, I deduce that the Burley Library must contain the Burr uh, Hamlet. The yeah, Hamlet? Yeah. What's that? The original play so, of Stride like Thomas King, upon which Shakespeare based his so, version. Not a single copy is known to exist in the entire world, Watson. It would be well, absolutely priceless. Gracious me. I say, Holmes, look. Up there ahead. Just going to give some a man's back beyond those trees. I will, I will aim it must be Burley. Good. The, Mr. Burley. The little bit Mr. Burley. The wind's blowing towards us. He can't hear you. Fine. Hurry up, Watson. You can catch him beyond that bend in the path. He's just. Great heavens. Yeah. How appalling. What Why, the man's literally blown to bits. Why, As I feared, Watson. Why, we were just too late. Right Oh, uh, you wrote twice? Oh, I'm also trying to myself. Oh. <laughs> okay. It would be interesting to see if Sherlock Holmes really was too late. Okay. But I mean, men, it's myself. never too late to right. help improve the appearance of your hair. If you're having trouble keeping your hair in place, yeah. if it's dry, <laughs> lifeless looking, why not try why Cremel hair, hair you, you mean... Honestly, I think Kreml is by far one of the greatest hairdressings ever discovered. Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning until night, with a nice, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy look. It never smothers hair down with sticky goo, which makes the hair and scalp feel so dirty. In addition, Kreml makes hair a cinch to comb. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. It relieves itching of and dry scalp and makes your scalp feel so clean and refreshed. Next time you get a haircut, ask your barber for an application of creme. Right. In the meantime, and, uh, buy a bottle of the any drug this time. K R E M L. Cremo yeah. hair tonic. Oh, and now, Dr. Watson, what happened when you and Sherlock Holmes found that Mr. Burley had been the victim of an explosion on those Cornish cliffs? Holmes sent me back to the house. As soon as I had reported well, what had happened, I had it back to the cliffs where I found Holmes standing lost in meditation. His tall, gaunt <laughs> form silhouetted against the sea. Yep. Holmes, I've sent a servant from the house to fetch the police. Good man. Uh, what's that you've got there? <laughs> Barely identifiable fragments of the lunchbox Burley was carrying. From the marks of the explosion, it is obvious I mean, that the bomb was in it. I see. Wait, Scott, Holmes. Young Mrs. Burley said that she packed that lunchbox. Precisely. 
will observe these footprints leading away here in the softer ground at the edge of the path. Naked footprints. That barefoot boy, the, the idiot. He saw it happen, was frightened by the explosion, and ran away in a panic. You'll notice how smooth the footprints are? Smooth? Uh, never mind. There's little we can do now but await the police. And I doubt if it will be long before they arrest a murderer. <laughs> I should like to suggest, Superintendent Maddox, that you broaden the course of your inquiry. If you don't mind, Mr. Holmes, I can conduct my questioning in my own way. Not at all, Superintendent. How come they say I'm Mrs. Burley? It'll be a lot better for you if you help me instead of hindering me. I've been trying to answer your question, Superintendent. Well, only a fool could fail to see where they're leading. Now, Lila, the Superintendent's only trying to find out the truth. Very well. I'm innocent. And if all you want is the truth, you should have it. I hated my father-in-law, and he hated me. Lila, don't say anything. And that is it. All the gossip you picked up from the servants this afternoon is true, Superintendent. My husband and I quarreled this morning. Quarreled bitterly. Stephen talked of divorce. His father's constant pressure has made him so confused that he no longer knows his own mind. That's not true, Lila. I still love you. So if that's what you wanted to know, Superintendent? Yes. Yes. I can't I hated him. I hated him. I think that'll be quite enough, Mrs. Burley. I shall have to take you with me to the chief constable. The charge is murder. Oh, you're crazy, Maddox. My wife didn't kill my father. The fact that she's told you all these things should be proof enough. I'm sorry, Mr. Burley. I've got to do my duty as I see it. Come along, Mrs. Burley. Very well. I'm ready. I'll come along with you, my dear. No, darling. Stay here and help Mr. Holmes in any way you can. No, That's today. the best way for you to help. Yeah. She's quite right, my boy. Like so come along, Mrs. Burley. I, I can't understand why it does. Mr. Holmes, you further ringy I'll offer you any sum you wish to clear my wife. No, Your father was my client. I already have a duty to find his murderer. And you think that Lila... I think the superintendent would have arrested her twice as quickly if he had known of the other possible motive. That in revenge she had conspired with Professor Moriarty against your father. Then you're leaving. You won't help me. There are loose ends to clear up, Mr. Burley. I must send Dr. Watson on an errand. As for myself, my first objective is to inspect the famous Burley Library. I brought you some sandwiches, Mr. Holmes. You've been in here for hours. I'm afraid I've rather lost track of time. Have you found what you wanted? I did not find it. And nothing could be more significant than its absence. There is no sign here, Mr. Burley, of the black letter Hamlet which you described. Well, that's funny. I distinctly remember that... Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Any luck, Watson? No, not a bit. I missed my supper and had a wild goose chase for my pain. You mean you couldn't find the half-witted boy? Checked every house in the village. I'm afraid he will Even never return. Yes? You mean you think that he saw yeah. too much? I mean, Watson, no, that the person who planted that eyes. bomb also murdered that poor boy. Doing, if you could have some lanterns at once, please, Mr. Burley. Of course. I think we'd better well, follow the tracks of those bare feet to their final destination. <laughs> seems to lead right down the face of the cliff. If you call it a path, where the devil does it lead to? If you look over the edge of the cliff... Look over here. Careful. It's a 200-foot drop to those rocks below. You see a dark opening some 40 or 50 feet down? One of the caves, precisely. And except for this extremely precipitous and presumably unknown path, a cave completely hidden and inaccessible save from below by way of the water. Come on. Careful, Holmes. Look out for those rocks. Oh, 
Shall not be on this topic of solving mysterious problems. But here's one hair problem which those beautiful powers models solve. We discovered there's nothing better than cremel shampoo to bring out all the hair's natural glossy luster. Cremel shampoo actually keeps our hair shining bright today. And cremel shampoo does such a marvelous cleaning job. Oh, Even in God, the heart. So hard Wendy to serves to fresh, never frozen this. beef on this every hamburger. Fucking... That's why our Dave single is so hot no, and juicy. No, but what if that Dave single was buy one, get one for a buck? And all these faves were too. Did any of these faves bogo one dollar only at Wendy's? Hard as water, it's rich, active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its glorious natural brilliance. Even after the first shampoo, your hair looks a vision of love. And don't forget to mention how its beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. Yes, I know. That's why my wife always uses cremel shampoo for our youngster's hair. In fact, everyone at our house uses cremel shampoo because it's so mild and gentle on the hair. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. Just ask for Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes unmasked the sinister Dr. Punsonberg, head of a boys' school, and thus saved the life of one of the pupils. I've always referred to this particularly bizarre adventure as the singular affair of the dying school Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the dying school Okay, so the next thing to focus on, on the back. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting. I think it might have been easy to see the back. I don't think we're going to focus on this again. I am charged now for him. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to call on our old friend, that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I won't get up if you don't mind. This change in the weather has given me a twinge or two of rheumatism, I'm afraid. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Dr. Watson. Uh, we old fossils can't expect to be as hale and hearty as you young fellows. You know. I don't know that I feel so young today, Dr. Watson. I stopped by the military academy this afternoon and saw my cousin there. He's 13 years old, and after an hour with him, I realized I'm really quite... Now, there is actually a... Uh, I think there's an action that makes it harder He's happy at the school, Mr. Bell? Crazy about it. Yes, I'm sure that in this day and age, a boy almost looks forward to going to school. Conditions were far different yes, in other parts attack, of England before the turn of the century, I'm afraid. I'm thinking in particular of a school that Holmes like and I had occasion to visit and of the frightened I mean, and happy youngsters who lived there yeah. in mortal terror of their lives. Oh, this has all the hallmarks of the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is, my boy. It's a story I call uh, The Singular the Affair of the Dying Schoolboy. But before I begin, haven't you a message for our listeners? Yes, I have. Folks, it looks as if we're in for plenty of excitement tonight with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And men, I'll bet right you'll now. be plenty excited about the great improvement in the appearance of your hair once you use Cremel hair tonic. Frankly, I've tried any number of hairdressings, fact, but it I took Cremel to really uh, convince me that my hair can always be neat without having to plaster it down with grease or those sticky, gooey concoctions. Um, but he's, he's and Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. It makes hair so much I'm easier to comb and actually helps uh, condition the hair. And it leaves it feeling so much right softer, easier to manage. At the same time, Cremel removes embarrassing dandruff flakes. It relieves itching due to dry scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so clean, so alive. Man, what a treat. 
Now, be sure to buy a bottle at any drug counter spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Don't forget to the How about the singular affair of the dying school? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began on a stormy September evening in Baker Street many, many years ago. All day long, the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against our window. Shortly after dinner, there was the old familiar jangle on our front doorbell. A few moments later, Mrs. Hudson ushered a distinguished visitor into the room. As he stood there in front of the flickering firelight, I could see that he was a good-looking man and also that he was in a state of considerable Now, Lord Manders. If you will just give us the facts. Um, that's well, Mr. Holmes, three years ago, I was a passenger on that ill-fitted ship, the Sophie Anderson. She was wrecked in a gale, and I was the only survivor. I clung to a piece of broken spar and was washed ashore on. After that, for over two years, I lived alone on an island in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, when the Sophie Anderson foundered, I was believed to be dead. My young brother, Eric, who was next in line, inherited the estate and the guardianship of our uncle. Uh, action, so a lot of confusion when you arrived home this year, Lord Manders. There was, Dr. Watson, but not for the reason you suppose. I landed in England to find that my brother had died last December. He died under very peculiar circumstances. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. What were those circumstances? My uncle sent Eric to a school on the Wilsh Moors, not far from Cardiff. A school known as Punsonby Hall. He died in a school infirmary there. Supposedly of pneumonia. And you have some reason to believe it was not pneumonia? Nothing right, different. So I've been down to the school, but Dr. So Punsonby owner was too ill to see me. However, I did talk to a frightening woman there who was the matron of the place, a Mrs. Arkwright. I became suspicious. So I stayed on and for a few days made some local inquiries. With what I results? Uh, Punsonby Hall has a black name with the villagers, Mr. Holmes. Five boys have died there in the last two years under circumstances similar to my brother's. I presume that you immediately had an account with your uncle. My uncle had settled another account before my return, Mr. Holmes. He died of a heart attack last February. But I am certain he was responsible for Eric's death. You see, he stood to inherit the estate. It may sound incredible. But I believe Eric was murdered at Punson Bay Hall. Murdered in a boys' school? Oh, come, 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 sir. Those things can't happen in this 19th century. Okay, ah, but they can, Watson. And do, unfortunately. You don't mean it? I do. A private school situated in a desolate spot and operated by an unprincipled scoundrel could provide excellent and profitable opportunities for removing unwanted relatives. Ghastly thought, Mr. Holmes. I know that Eric's dead and nothing can bring him to life again. But I can try and avenge his death and bring his murderer to justice. You will help me, won't you? Yes, Lord Manders, I will. If these shocking occurrences have been taking place, we may be able at least to prevent further tragedies. Watson, suppose we join Lord Manders on the West of England Express tonight, and tomorrow see what can be done to penetrate the black clouds that surround Punsonby Hall. <laughs> Walking in the wrong direction, Mr. Holmes, the school is tremendous. Oh, okay, Before going there, I thought we might probably pay a visit here in the village to Llewellyn Coffin. Well, who's he? The local undertaker. An undertaker named Coffin? Yeah, the first <laughs> it, no, you know, very funny, isn't it? Coffin undertaker. Quite. But try and control your amusement, will you, Watson? Get this establishment now. Mr. Coffin? Yes, sir. It's my name, Coffin. We're strangers in these parts and we're in search of information. I'm hoping, Mr. Coffin, that you'll be able to help us. Do what I can do, sir, I will, and do it gladly. I understand that you had an unusually large proportion of business from Punsonby Hall in the past two years. Five boys died, didn't they? Five boys it was. Mr. Coffin, we've heard some strange stories in the village. Yes. Stories that make us wonder if those deaths were from natural causes. Gentlemen, I'm a simple man, look you. A man who plies his trade but cannot afford to ask questions. What goes on at Punsonby Hall, and I'll not say strange things haven't happened there, is none of my business. Then let me appeal to your sympathies. My young brother died at Punsonby Hall last December. You must have buried him. Your brother? Well, now look you, that makes it different. But you'll not say anything up at the hall, sir. Dr. Punson is a savage man. Don't worry on that score, Mr. Coffin. What do you have to knowing, sir? All the five boys were supposed to have had pneumonia, I understand. 
That's what the medical report said. Who signed those reports? Dr. Ponsonby himself. He's a regular medical doctor, look you. How very convenient. No questions had to be asked. Mr. Coffin, when you prepared those bodies for burial, did you notice anything unusual about them? Anything to make you think their deaths were possibly not caused by pneumonia? No, sir. Think now. Think, uh, uh, well, now that you mention it, there was one thing I was after noticing. Oh, what was that, my good man? The boys had a strange look on their faces as they lay there, as if something had frightened the wits out of them just before they died. That's very odd. The face of anyone dying from pneumonia would be in repose. Did you notice anything else, Mr. Coffin? Any other peculiarity? Well, there was one thing, sir, that gave me to thinking. All the boys had marks on them. Mm, stretch marks they were on their necks or shoulders. Perhaps they were bites. Rem remember Dr. Rylett of Stroke Moran Holmes? Uh, did these marks look like the bites of a snake, Mr. Coffin? No, that they weren't. Look, you, I know a snake bite when I see one. Didn't these marks make you suspicious? That they did, sir. And when I saw them on the boys, I took my courage in my hands and asked Dr. Ponsonby. And what did he say? Inoculation marks. He said that he had tried to save them with some newfangled medicine. No autopsy was held on the boys? No, sir. Dr. Ponsonby is the only doctor in these parts, look you. He gave the certificates. Who was to ask any questions? Exactly. Come on, Watson, Lord Manders. This has been a very promising start. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. You've been most helpful. It was a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen. But please don't be after repeating what I said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I think you'll agree my suspicions were well grounded. Yes. And we'll lose no time investigating this matter. I think we may work fast if we divide our forces. I shall return to the inn and compose a telegram that I shall ask you to send for me, Lord Manders. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Aren't you going to Punsonby Hall, Holmes? Not immediately. However, you, my dear Watson, can be my advance guard. Me? Yes. I think that your open countenance, combined with that delightful Scottish accent you sometimes assume, plus an appropriate name, should lull Dr. Punsonby into believing that he has another wealthy customer who needs his very specialized services. Well, Holmes, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Just the same, I'll be very relieved when you get on the scene. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Arkwright, the school matron. Whom did you wish to see? I want to have a word with Dr. Ponsonby. My name is Angus McLaughlin, and I'm most anxious to send my young cousin here. Oh? Aye, he needs discipline. And I'm told that you dinner pamper a young lad here. Please come in. I'm sure Dr. Ponsonby will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Arkwright. Copy. Go in, please. Dr. Punsonby? Yes, uh, please sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Angus McLaughlin. I've traveled all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I was told that at your school, you at least know how to uh, discipline a lad. Well, Mr. McLaughlin, <laughs> in our modest way, we endeavor to inculcate our students with a sense of responsibility. Aye, aye, aye. I was about to have a glass of wine. Perhaps you'd care to join me? Well, that's very kind of you, Dr. Pantsman. I'd like to. You uh, wish to send a relative here, Mr. McLaughlin? Aye, sir. Uh, a young cousin of mine, if you'll, if you'll take him. Here's your wine, Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, sir. And to your very good health. Ah, that's very good. <laughs> Tell me more about your cousin, sir. Before I accept a new student, I like to know as much about him as possible. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. He's 13 years old and he's a young devil, and an inconvenient young devil, too. You see, Dr. Ponsonby, I'm his guardian. You, you follow me? No, sir, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a poor man, and I'd be a very wealthy one if... Uh, it went for that boy. The whippersnapper is the only person who stands between me and uh, my dead brother's fortune. I wouldn't uh, be sorry if, <laughs> if anything were to happen to him. Uh, am I making myself quite uh, clear, Doctor? Much clearer, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Another glass of wine? Thank you. Well, it's, it's very good. 
Mr. McLaughlin, why not put all your cards on the table? So much simpler that way. Very well. Does 10,000 pounds mean anything to you, Dr. Ponsonby? Dear me, yes. The scholastic profession is notoriously unremunerative. If my young cousin were to be taken ill, perhaps, shall we say, uh, with pneumonia, if he... Uh, if he were to, to die here at your school, uh, or, or as you say, uh, I'd pay you 10,000 pounds. Uh, uh, now, sir, I, I can't be more explicit than that. No, 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 can I? I don't think so. <laughs> By the way, Mr. McLaughlin, your Scottish accent is beginning to disappear. Such a pity. It was quite colourful. Uh, wine's drugs. You, you haven't touched your wine's drugs. I'm a most abstemious man. <laughs> Particularly on occasions like this, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, uh, how, how did you know my name? Even in this remote spot, I've seen photographs of you and your friend, the famous Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm just a little hurt that you both thought I was stupid enough to be fooled so easily. Oh, you seem dreadfully sleepy. Dr. Watson. Sleep, yes, sir. I've got to go to sleep. And sleep well, my friend. <laughs> I only hope that you don't have too much trouble waking up. Well, guys, it's about to be that time again where I just... I've got to go offline for a little bit so I can charge my tablet. But I shall return, and they will know my incredibleness. I believe it. So you guys have a great one. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.